Let's look at how concepts under the term capital describe how people find themselves in preset societal roles that often predict and control their sense of security, accomplishments, goals, and prejudices. The term capital attempts to explain how people in all societies often subliminally play roles. Now, you may be asking what kinds of roles people are playing. And to answer this question, we must open the windows in our minds and pull back the screens to get an unfiltered view of the world around us and, for good or bad, discover how we are all interconnected. Welcome to Four C's One Family. Based this discussion on research from French sociologist Pierre Bardeur, whose works highlighted how social classes, especially in nations with powerful intellectual and ruling classes, use their accumulated influence and resources to protect and preserve their financial and social privileges across generations, as well as react in national politics, economic crisis, and under reactionary influences. Much of his procured data goes against contemporary Western thought that exaggerates equality of opportunity and social mobility. Odor's impactful research is the most cited reference to explain modern day class struggles. Please look at the supplied links below for more information about Pierre Odor. Regardless of where you are, where you come from, or where you have been, Societal roles are embedded within the culture your existence depends on. These roles may have naturally evolved or have been manufactured to maintain constructs that requires members of a population to engage in interactions that ensure their survival. Today, most sociologists would define capital as a classification or segmentation of what individuals are initially given or possess, often without great effort. Merely being a member of a capital class helps an individual gain knowledge of what should be known in their particular communal environment. And these capitals are often segmented related to age, ethnicity, gender, social class, religion, and nowadays even sexual and political preference. The term represents the amount or degree of resources a person possesses, often without great effort, within a partitioned population segment they are considered, perceived, or required to be a member of. Now, there are benefits to possessing more of a particular capital over another. For example, those born or who have less of a specific capital may lack the skills, talent, and tools needed to compete in a particular social environment or professional field. It becomes essential for them to acquire more of another type of capital, and this is when terms like cultural, economic, and social capital are applied to explain how and sometimes why segments of a population have a certain amount of a particular capital, and also how their roles in society become symbiotic or, in some cases, parasitical. However, individuals with a low amount of one capital may find ways to increase more of another or preferred capital, and maybe this is what some people may call social mobility. Let's examine how these terms represent influential and often segmented groups in society. Now, before I continue, I would like to emphatically state that I am referencing the relationship between different capitals in not only democratic nations, but also in totalitarian nations and nations under strict religious governing. I want you to understand how these descriptive capitals are widespread no matter location and regardless of culture, income, faith, or government structure. These capitals are commonly used to promote and protect financial, political, religious, and ideological goals that may only benefit those who have the power to influence and change the direction of a nation and even the world. Most people want as much capital as they can afford or obtain to protect themselves from unfortunate events and fend off those who they perceive are their competitors or enemies. This is why I see cultural, economic, and social capital much like umbrellas. People use them to protect themselves from unfortunate situations. And very much like umbrellas, 
people sometimes misuse, borrow, and steal them. In other words, people use their capital to keep themselves comfortable and above all, safe. Now let's begin with explaining the different types of capitals and how they are often used and even abused. Economic capital may be the easiest of these capital classes to visualize because it's directly connected to the economic problems members of this class possess. So the size and number of financial resources a member has matters. Economic capital requires access to and control of financial resources such as money, property, and investments. Individuals with high economic prosperity have greater access to education, employment, and social mobility. Acquiring and controlling economic capital helps individuals, their family members, and close, like-minded acquaintances achieve goals and access rare, usually, business opportunities. Many of those with considerable economic capital can trace their financial position to the hard work done by past generations or inheritance. Some can trace their wealth to political confrontations or violent conflicts that may have ended in war or suppressed voices and opinions, which most likely included the tactful or forceful acquisition of land and other resources. Those fortunate enough to possess a large amount of economic capital are usually exposed to quality art and educational opportunities. Many are from families that can afford to travel often, allowing them to visit exciting and exotic places and meet people of different and various cultures and backgrounds. Travel opportunities ignite interest in learning foreign languages and details about locations mentioned in documentaries, magazines, novels, textbooks, and trending topics on the internet. As a result, the information presented in school about culture, current events, history, and most importantly, economics becomes relatable and quickly internalized. And because of their experience, they may become curious and inspired to pursue advanced education in a particular field. Above all, they most likely have access to sound financial advice and connections that help them maintain their social and cultural status. Because of their quality subliminal education and experience during their informative years, those who possess a, or acquire a vast amount of economic capital are less likely to become victims of social and economic decline and more confident and ultimately resilient to opposing life struggles. Now, of course, there are exceptions because it's impossible to portray everyone with a large amount of economic capital in this way. Because only some people like the pair of shoes they are expected to wear. Having a clear understanding of culture enables one to imply unspoken rules and behaviors instead of expressing them directly. This is where cultural capital comes into play and can be used to avoid unseen social obstacles and improve communication skills. It acts like a compass guiding individuals in the right direction for interacting with others and preventing misunderstandings. You see, cultural capital is, is obtained and displayed differently in different cultures. And this goes beyond just learning something like a spoken language. Individuals with refined cultural capital have honed their ability to present themselves in a manner that is not offensive or aggressive. They have acquired knowledge regarding the appropriate language, etiquette, and fashion to display, as well as the necessary qualifications to make a positive impact in the social circles they need to engage with to achieve their objectives. The inability to function under unspoken cultural rules may cause outsiders to have difficulties decoding and adjusting to undeclared actions and behaviors. They often need more accepted cultural skills to succeed within the environment their survival may depend on because neglecting to do so could lead to missed opportunities. So when in Rome, it's often hard for some outsiders to do as the Romans do. In some situations, properly understanding cultural capital allows an individual to compete with those with higher academic qualifications. 
for example, individuals who graduated from renowned schools often land high-paying jobs. But many need more interpersonal communication skills to work effectively with colleagues from diverse backgrounds. On the other hand, those who have developed positive cultural communication skills but graduated from less prestigious schools become more valuable because they can motivate others to collaborate and find solutions to problems. They may also become a source of inspiration for creative thinking. Now, of course, like anything else, situations vary. This is just one example of how economic dexterity doesn't always lead to success in all situations and environments. Cultural capital is just another tool to have in your personal and professional toolbox. Entities hidden deeply within levels of society create circumstances or instances that don't have direct ties to a shared culture or objective. Its sole purpose is to build trust and maintain attraction. This is when social capital becomes an attention getter that helps an individual appear trustworthy and reliable. Social capital is built from trusted networks of people that allow free flows of ideas and concerns to be gathered, discussed, referenced, and judged. Individuals who have earned or built vast amounts of social capital can effortlessly request aid or assistance from within their social circle. Obtaining social capital and building a personal or professional social network may seem intimidating, but it may not be as complicated as it appears. Contact people you have previously studied or worked with to reconnect or strengthen your current connections. Take the opportunity to outline your goals and inquire about theirs, just briefly. Now, this could lead to fruitful conversations and potential collaborations. Once you have developed or re-established relationships, politely request to be introduced to others with similar interests and objectives. Expand your social network through virtual communication tools. Use popular social networks to gather ideas concerning other people's general thoughts and opinions. And if possible, express any interests or concerns you have to build camaraderie. Now, it's essential that you keep your comments appropriate and sincere because if any statement you make turns out to be insincere, building camaraderie may never be possible. Or even worse, you may be blacklisted. Relationships built through social networks can be exchanged to encourage support for collective social actions and even national goals. Social networks rooted in different types of social capital often work together to obtain benefits and shared goals. And as I mentioned earlier, individuals with a low amount of one type of capital may be able to find ways to increase more of another or preferred capital. And depending on the time, having more of a particular or preferred capital may not always offer the same privileges, opportunities, and rights that those with more of another capital may have. Regardless of how much capital we possess, there are personal life scripts that we may prefer to follow that motivate us and give us the will to continue. Irrespective of your personal beliefs, I hope you can objectively, without leaning left or right, recognize how promoted constructs push us either too far to either side. I hope there is still time for cultural, political, and personal redirection. If you have found what we have to offer of any value, please click on the subscribe and bell buttons below to keep up to date with our current episodes. And if you're listening to our podcast, please subscribe and help us spread the word that we have a lot more in common than we think. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. For Seas One Family, I'm James Thomas in Taipei, Taiwan. And remember to stay strong, safe, and healthy wherever you are in the world.